Welcome ladies and gentlemen to another session of forecasting. Forecasting is a science as we have seen in our previous sessions, no matter how imperfect. French as French mathematician and the pioneer of chaos theory, Henry Pankir once said, it is far better to foresee even without certainty than not to foresee at all. We will continue our discussion on forecasting with our expert, Dr. Muhammad Abbas Chaudhary. Ladies and gentlemen, so far we have covered the importance of forecasting in business decisions, qualitative forecasting methods, and the quantitative forecasting methods. During the last session, we discussed exponential smoothing with trend adjustment. We also used trend projection using least square method for forecasting and we learned how the seasonality index is developed and used in forecasting. Our agenda for this session is associative forecasting methods, regression and correlation analysis, using regression analysis for forecasting, standard error of the estimate, correlation coefficients for regression lines, multiple regression analysis, monitoring and controlling forecasts, in which we'll discuss adaptive smoothing, focus forecasting, and finally, we'll discuss forecasting in the service sector. Now, I will request Sir Abbas to advance our understanding on forecasting. Sir. Well, thank you, Aisha. Uh, you mentioned uh, Henry Poincare and the chaos theory. Uh, number one, mathematics is complex. We are all familiar with that. And chaos theory is even complexer. That tells us in science, it means it is not as simple as generally uh, we assume that things will be simple. And in forecasting, uh, it gets difficult. Uh, for example, chaos theory, when you mentioned, chaos theory is a subject which involves and uh, the, the scientists in economics, in mathematics, in philosophy, and in physics, they have used uh, this chaos theory. It means the things are much more complex than actually uh, we generally perceive. Uh, and the situation is not uh, much different as far as forecasting is concerned. Uh, I'll, 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 I'll ask a question. Uh, do you have an idea that while making a weather forecasting, how many variables will be there? Practically, it is not few, it is not dozen. We may, uh, let's say, recall only four, five, six, but actually it can be hundreds and thousands of various variables that go in making a forecast, a weather forecast. If you are going to make a local weather forecast, and then you are going to make a regional weather forecast and global weather forecast. And numbers and numbers and number of variables are involved in making actually the forecast, whether it's going to rain or it's going to sunshine or it's going to be cloudy and so on. What will be the temperature? What will be the humidity and so on? All these things uh, means become part of making a weather forecast. It's absolutely complex. Similarly, if you want to make a forecast of, let's say, economic forecast uh, during the last 10 years, what will be the trend? Again, you will be uh, dealing with hundreds of thousands of variables in making an economic forecast, uh, let's say, for what will be the global economic uh, condition. As such, forecasting is not a simple science. Forecasting is very complex, although uh, uh, that type of forecasting is 
not part of our uh, course here, we'll be discussing fairly manageable uh, forecasting method here. And associated forecasting, forecasting methods are basically where how a variable or how few variable impact on the uh, variable which we are trying to uh, forecast or we are trying to predict. And associated methods uh, or associated forecasting methods are used when change in one or more independent variable can be used to predict the change in the dependent variable. Okay, most common techniques is linear regression. You remember we uh, fitted the regression line into the historical data. Exactly same thing we'll be doing here in the associated forecasting model, but using a different data. And we apply this technique just as we did to the time series example. Okay, in associative forecasting, uh, an outcome is based on the predicted variable, predictor variable using the least square. Again, same equation y hat equal to a plus bx, where y is a computed value of the dependent variable, a is y axis intercept, b is slope of the line, x is the independent variable uh, through to predict the value of the dependent variable. This is the associated, we'll be again fitting uh, the, uh, th this equation to our historical data. Uh, not historical data, how one changes in one variable impact the predict variable we predict. Let's say we have this in this example, we have sales in millions, which is y, 2, 3, 2.5, 2, 2, 2.3. And uh, here value of xr, which is independent variable, is 1, 3, 4, 2, 1, 7. The point here is we're trying to look into how the area payroll is going to impact the sales of particular uh, in in particular area for a product or service or whatever okay and uh, in this example we see sales y submission y payroll x submission x x square xy submission and we calculate x bar which is 3 we calculate y bar which is 2.5 we calculate b slope of the line and we calculate a which is this one now, this is our equation. Now, in this equation, our variable is x. As the x varies, we'll see what is the impact on uh, your sales. Let's say x is our payroll. Uh, x can be 4, 5, 6, 10, whatever. Whatever is the x, how x is related to y hat or our sales here. In payroll, uh, if payroll next year is estimated to be, let's say, $6 billion, then sales will be 1.75 plus 0.25 into 6. This is our value of x. And it says, uh, this is our calculation here. Okay. Uh, and this is how, in, in the graph, it's predicted that this is the area payroll, how area payroll can impact on the sales, and this is the line. Here we come up with this, this we call the point estimate of y. Okay, uh, in, the, in the next diagram we'll uh, explain it further. I mentioned that this forecast using uh, this method is a forecast is just a point estimate of the future value. This point here, y. This point is actually the mean of the probability distribution. We see here uh, this, this normal curve. Actually, this is the mean value at any point in this area could be a forecast. Our actual forecast will be somewhere in this area, in this region. Actually, or, and this point is the point value of our, uh, we call it point value of y. Okay, And this will not be perfect unless we look at what is the standard error of the estimate and how we calculate that? It, uh, no, okay. When we say this is the point value, it means our actual value is going to be in this region, right? In order to have the exact value, we have to calculate standard error of the estimate. How do we do that? We do it using uh, uh, this formula where y is the value of the each data point and yc is a computed value of the dependent variable from the regression equation. N is the number of data point. Or we can also uh, computationally, this is another equation which we can use uh, for calculating the standard error of uh, standard error of the estimate. 
generally, uh, this equation seems a little bit complex, but it is relatively easier to use. And we use uh, this standard error to set up prediction interval around the point estimate. Here we see, we calculate the standard error using this equation. We calculated standard error, which is 0 0.306, $100,000. Now, uh, the standard error of estimate in this is 30,600 in sales. Okay? This is how we, uh, it, it means our actual, our forecasted value, point, uh, point value of y can vary this much, right? right? We, but, but will remain, generally will remain in this region, okay? Sir, is there any other way to show the relationship among the variables? Oh, for sure, I mean, there is, uh, there is uh, uh, a, a concept we call correlation. Means if the two vari variables have some sort of relationship or not, we call it correlation, uh, which measure the, or expresses the degree of strength of the two variable relationship. If we have a variable A and variable B, the correlation will measure, will be given, will, will give us the measure of strength of the relationship between the two variables. And we call, uh, we measure it calling the coefficient of correlation, which can have a value between plus one and minus one. And we calculate uh, the coefficient of correlation using uh, this equation, where R is coefficient co correlation, and this is R. Uh, equation. And then if we uh, square the coefficient of correlation R square, we call it coefficient of determination, which is the measure of percent of change in Y predictability, the change of X. Percent change in Y predictability by the change in X. Okay, And value ranges between 0 and 1. And it is generally easier to interpret. Uh, there is an example uh, in your Heiser book, uh, nodal construction example, where they have used R value of, if R, value of R is 0 0.901, R square will be 0 0.81. And, uh, okay, as we mentioned, that co value of correlation can vary from point, uh, plus 1 to minus 1. In this, uh, for example, uh, diagram, we see perfect positive X correlation with Y. We see all the point, data point on, means as the x increases, so does y, and we have a perfect correlation where r will be coefficient of correlation, r will be plus one here, okay? In this example, there is a positive correlation. The points are not exactly on, uh, on, on your uh, line here. There is a positive correlation, which is zero is less or equal r less or less than one. Zero is less than R is less than one. It means your value can vary between zero and one because of the positive nature of the correlation here. Okay? Or no correlation. Here we see the, uh, the data points are scattered, random, and there is no correlation as we say. Then we say R or R, uh, there is no correlation, R equal zero. Our coefficient of correlation is zero here. And this diagram indicates a negative correlation, perfect negative correlation because all our data point are, points are, as the value of x increase, the value of y decreases. This is what we call a negative correlation. Sir, uh, generally there are more than one independent variables that impact the dependent variables. How do we handle these situations? You are you're perfectly uh, uh, correct, Aisha. It is not one variable impacting on other. It is a group of variables, independent variables impacting on others. And an example will be, let's say, uh, sales could be a function of your advertising budget, the competitor price, the season, the economic condition, and so on. There will be number of variable that impact the uh, dependent variable. Similarly, as we say, let's say rain, if we, if we want to forecast rain, and it will be dependent on number of variables, right? And generally, we can use the regression, but we call that multiple regression. In multiple, using multiple regression analysis, we can calculate the relationship of 
uh, number of independent variable and their impact on dependent variable. If more than one independent variable is to be used in the model, linear regression can be extended to multiple regression, what we call to accommodate several independent variables. And then equation, our equation, you remember our equation y hat equal a plus bx, it will be extended in this format, y hat will be equal a plus b1x1 plus b2x2 and computationally this will be, I mean, means if the more number of variable you have, the complex equation will become and the solution of this equation will be generally done with the help of computers and obviously computer models. In multiple regression, uh, in the Noodle example, we'll replicate the Noodle construction example given in the Heiser book. Including interest rates in the model gives a new equation. Okay? Previously, we looked at what is the impact of the payroll on, uh, on, on your sales. On now, here we see we add not we add uh, the uh, the interest rates as a variable which is x2 then our equation will become y hat is equal 1 plus 80 plus 0 0.30 x1 minus 5.0 uh, x2 means we are adding another variable an improved correlation coefficient of r equal 0.96 okay means this model does a better job of predicting the change in the construction sale and we calculate the sales which is 3 since uh, we will, will multiply it with 100,000 because this is 3.00 uh, dollar 100,000 times which is 300,000 dollars. Sir, how do we monitor that how well the forecasts are predicting the actual values? Uh, Aisha, it's, it's very uh, critical. When we make a forecast, what we do is we generally set an upper limit, we generally set a lower limit. If our forecast goes within these limits, then we say it is all right, it is acceptable. We call this is our upper control limit, this is our lower control limit. As long as we remain within the region, it is fine, it is acceptable. As long as early as we go beyond that, we say uh, our, our prediction is uh, going off. Okay, we call that tracking signal. Okay, uh, measures how well the forecast is predicting the actual values. Once again, tracking signal measures how well the forecast is predicting actual variables. And how we calculate that? It is basically ratio of the running sum of the forecast error. Running sum of the forecast error to mean absolute deviation. And good tracking signal will generally have low values and if forecasts are continually high or low, the forecast has a bias error, what we call. Okay. Uh, this is an example of uh, a tracking signal. Let's say this is our mean absolute deviations, and this is the uh, upper control limit, positive upper control limit, this is lower control limit. Over a period of time, this is our acceptable range. You see here, the up, between the upper and lower limit, as long as our, our mad line is this, mean absolute deviation is here, and this is actual. As long as our forecast remain within the limit, fine. When we try to get exceed the limit, then we call it, no, wait a minute, there is something wrong. We need to better fix it. This is how we measure the accuracy of the forecast. And uh, tracking signal, the formula for tracking signal is uh, this running sum of the forecast error divided by MAD. This is uh, the detail of that. And uh, in an example here uh, is our calculation, actual demand, forecast demand, error, running sum of forecast error, absolute forecast error. This is cumul cumulative absolute forecast error map. And this is how we calculate tracking signal. Minus 10 over 10, minus 15 over 7.5, and so on. The variation in the tracking signal between minus 2 and plus 2.5 is with an acceptable limit. Wherever we are beyond that, then it goes, we say there is a problem in that. Right. Sir, can we have a system that continuously monitors the variations in the forecast errors and adjusts our forecast accordingly? Asha, this is actually uh, how it happens. In the modern forecasting system, it is not that you make a forecast and then you sleep on it and you say that we have done our job, no. In good forecasting, uh, where the forecasting is involved, in operations management, and you have to be very 
clear and very uh, alert to it, how your forecast is moving. And if there are a tracking signal is giving you uh, some uh, abnormalities, you have to adjust it. And you have to stay close to what actuals are. If your forecaster, your forecast should not go much beyond the desired or acceptable limits. And we'll do it, what we call uh, adoptive forecasting. In the adoptive forecasting, what we do is, uh, it is possible to use computer to continually more monitor the forecast error and adjust the value of alpha and beta so that you remain within the acceptable limits. And uh, a coefficient used in the exponential smoothing to continue minimize the forecast error. The objective is to minimize the forecast error and this technique is called adoptive smoothing. Yet there is another uh, forecasting technique what we call focus forecasting. And in focus forecasting which was developed at the American hardware supply uh, is based on two principles. One, sophisticated forecasting models are not always better than the simple ones. Sometimes very simple forecasting technique is very robust and gives you very good example. And there's no single technique that should be used for all the product or services. Now, these two principles, it means one forecasting technique may be good for one product or other forecasting technique may be good for others. What in focus forecasting we do is for each product, we see which technique gives us the best forecast for a particular product or particular service and then apply uh, uh, that technique to that, that particular product. And this approach uses historical data to test the multiple forecasting model for individual items. We use uh, model one, two, three, four, five, six on one product. And we see which forecast model gives you the best result. Then next product, then next product, then next product. And then forecasting model with the lowest error is used to forecast the demand. Right. So how does the forecast in service sector different from that of the manufacturing? Okay, uh, I think Aisha, it's a, it's a very uh, important uh, question. And you remember we were looking at uh, the forecasting in uh, hospital, uh, San Diego hospital example we gave. Generally, forecasting techniques, as long as the data, we, first of all, we look at the data, we look at what actually we are going to forecast, what is the time horizon, and then try to adjust our forecasting model to the forecast. However, there are certain very specific uh, characteristics of the services. And these services require, uh, let's say, hourly projection in certain cases. And uh, various parts of the day means your forecast duration is smaller. Uh, special needs and what in service sector we require is uh, special needs for a short term records and needs differ greatly as function of industry and a product as I mentioned earlier, holidays and other calendar events and certain unusual events. I'll explain that with the help of an example. This uh, we know uh, fast food restaurants are a type of service and we consider or categorize them as service. In fast food for example, the, the percentage of sale, th this diagram shows us the percentage of sales over hours of the day. We start with 11, 12 a.m. and then we go all around the clock. We see from 11 to 12 and then 12 to 1, 1 to 2. This is the busiest time for a fast period, okay? Then 2, 3, 3 to 4, 4 to 5, we go a dip here. And again, uh, when the evening starts from 5 to 6, 6 to 7 is the highest. Here the challenge will be, you have a fairly, uh, means your interval is one hour actually. That is a challenge as far as uh, forecasting in services is concerned. Uh, there's another example I'll give you. The Federal Express call center again is a service and the forecast shown in this diagram is AM hours here and the PM hours here. And we see, uh, means who is going to make a, a call to call center around let's say 2 AM or 4 a.m. or 6 a.m. means here our forecasting tells us, uh, I mean means the need, uh, how actually our uh, revenues are. This is the highest business time. 
from 6 a.m., then we start 7, actually it starts from 8 a.m., 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, and the busiest of the day is 2 p.m. to 4 p.m., and then again it starts fading down, okay? With this diagram, uh, I think the two diagrams which I mentioned, the fast food example and this uh, FedEx call center example, it gives us a, uh, an indication how forecasting in services can be different than the usual forecasting of products or usual forecasting in uh, different sectors. Thank you, sir. In this session, we discussed associative forecasting methods, regression and correlation analysis, using regression analysis for forecasting, standard error of the estimate, correlation coefficients for regression lines, multiple regression analysis, monitoring and controlling forecasts, adaptive smoothing, focus forecasting, forecasting in the service sector. With this, uh, this is it for now. Ladies and gentlemen, see you next time with a new topic. Till then, thank you and Allah Hafiz.